The Bible tells us that the gospel is offensive. Exactly why it is offensive uh, is really dependent on the culture of the day. You know, for example, in the ancient world, in you know, in the Roman Empire kind of times, uh, the gospel was offensive precisely because it called on people to have a, um, a loyalty, a dedication to Jesus over and above their dedication to the emperor. Now, this was seen as a major threat to the very fabric of their society. And in those days, you know, they believed that you could worship any of the numerous uh, sort of deities that were around as long as you were loyal to the emperor and to, um, uh, to him being in charge. And of course, the Christians there ultimately had a loyalty higher than the emperor. They were loyal to Christ. And that's why it was so offensive in those days. Today, the gospel is offensive uh, in, in our times for a slightly different reason. You know, we live in a pluralistic society. We live in a society that is, that is um, where every kind of belief is acceptable as long as it doesn't kind of affect the people around you. Our loyalty isn't primary, primarily to the emperor. In our day, we're told that our loyalty should be primarily to ourselves. Whatever belief system we think will be good for us personally, that's what we should be pursuing. You can choose to believe in God or, um, or Jesus or Muhammad or Buddha or nothing. Uh, or you could be an agnostic fence-sitter if you like. You are free to believe whatever you like as long as that belief doesn't sort of interfere with someone else's life. And part of the reason uh, for this is that people generally believe that all religions are basically the same. You know, but, uh, the phrase is kind of thrown around that every religion is essentially a different path up the same God mountain, if you like. Our society believes that every religion seeks to connect to the divine in its own kind of way, but that every belief system is equally valid, equally right, and ultimately results in basically the same kinds of good and decent people. We believe as a society that every major religious figure is essentially the same. They came to earth or to, um, they were incarnated to dispense wisdom, to teach people how to live good lives. They came to teach people how to, you know, love their neighbor and do good for the world. They, uh, the world we live in, Jesus is roughly equivalent to Gandhi or Buddha or Nelson Mandela. Basically, every kind of good and moral teacher is essentially the same. And then against this societal backdrop, Christianity remains scandalously offensive. In our case, it's precisely because Jesus himself makes some extraordinarily exclusive claims. You know, our faith stands up against the pluralism of our day and proclaims loudly, saying this is wrong. There is actually only one way to God. And this is offensive to the modern ear. When the modern person hears this, they are instantly offended. How dare we claim that we have the real truth among all the other truths that are available today? How dare we claim and how dare we decide for others what's true for them? How dare we claim to have an exclusive right to the top of the God mountain? Friends, it is because the Lord Jesus himself made these claims. We can't claim to trust in Jesus and accept uh, the kind of pluralism that our society lives in. We can't take Jesus at his word and still believe that each religion is essentially the same, basically a different road up the mountain. And in our text, Jesus is making this ex exclusive claim. He says that I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this kind of leaves us with three different questions. Why do we need Jesus to be the way? Why do we need Jesus to be the truth? And why do we need Jesus to be the life? So as we explore our text, let's keep these questions in mind. I'm reading here from John chapter 4, 14. Uh, so John chapter 14 from verse 1. 
Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I'm. Uh, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am going, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Lord, Thomas says, uh, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. And from now on you do know him and have seen him. Lord, said Philip, show us the Father and that's enough for us. Jesus said to, to him, Have I been among you all this time and you do not know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who lives in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. So the first question we have to ask this morning is, why do we need Jesus to be the way? The answer to that is because our access to God, our ability to come to God has been barred. We've been locked out. We've been shut out from our eternal home. You know, Jesus is here talking about how he's going to prepare our place in, in heaven, how he's going back to his eternal home to prepare a place for us. Now, our access to this home, to this place where God is, has been barred. It's kind of like when you drive to, say, the Prime Minister's house. You can't just walk in there. It is guarded by security. Your way has been barred. You, you can't get in unless you have a legitimate reason for getting into the house. You actually need someone, someone with authority to try and let you in, to give you some sort of access. But it's the same with us. Except we're not barred from the PM's house. Our way back to God has been barred. Our access to the Father, to the Heavenly Father, has been uh, barred ever since we, uh, we sinned, ever since sin came into the world. You see, Jesus has to be the way because we actually need someone to connect us to God. You know, a way is a, is a connector between two points. A way, if you like, is a path that leads from your starting point to your end destination. And what Jesus is saying is that he is the way. And when he does that, he's making a pretty radical claim. You see, he, he's saying that for us to get from where we are back to God, we need to come through him. To get home, we need Christ. He's, he's gone to the place where there are many rooms prepared especially for us. But for us to get there, we need him. To get from our starting place to our final destination, we need a way. So what is our starting place? Where do we begin? I think we need to appreciate that to understand what Jesus is really saying. Where is our starting place? Well, friends, Scripture teaches us that our starting place is death. It is complete and utter desolation. It is a full rejection of God and everything that he stands for. In our natural state, humans are defiantly spitting in the face of God, essentially saying, we don't want you. We don't want the life you have for us. We are perfectly fine by ourselves, thank you very much. In our natural state, you and I say to God, essentially, look how good I am. Look how great and majestic and wonderful I am. I am perfectly capable of living eternally by myself. And I would rather do it without you, God. Friends, we are spiritually dead. We are cut off and cast out from God's presence. Scripture teaches us that we are completely corrupt, totally broken and completely separate from God. 
Our sin has made us completely disconnected from God. And all of us, each and every one of us, faces eternal damnation and hell because of our sin. That's our starting point. That's where we begin. As a bunch of wretches drowning in our own pride and self-assurance and God-rejection. As people that are fully convinced that we're all pursuing a life that will give us meaning and all the while killing us slowly from the inside as it chokes the spiritual life out of us further. This is where we start from. And on the other side of the way, there is God. This is where uh, where we want to get, we, uh, where we need to get to. This is where God is. And you know, God is a God of love. Uh, a person whose love is so strong that all earthly loves are but a candle compared to the sun. Where even the fiercest, most passionate Romeo is but a drop in the ocean compared to, uh, to the love of God. Where God is, God is completely holy, completely righteous, completely just, completely glorious. God in whose presence sin simply cannot be. But then, how can we, these wicked, sinful, wretched creatures who actually don't even want God, who don't deserve to be in God's presence, how can we get to God? Well, the Bible teaches us that we can't. And that's the point. In and of ourselves, we cannot get to God. But have you noticed, friends, that that's what every kind of religion tries to do? It is to, in a sense, find its way back up the mountain to God. But the reality is that every religion isn't a different path up the God mountain. It's not as if God is at the top of the mountain and, and humanity is trying to wind its way back up to God via whichever religion you happen to be born into. No picture, no friends, the picture of the mountain is completely wrong. It doesn't work. God's not at the top of the mountain with us at the bottom. God is at the other end of a massive can, uh, chasm. A chasm of infinite depth. An infinite width, with a gap so big that no matter what we try and do, we cannot cross it. That's the picture. Our situation, apart from Jesus, is completely helpless, completely hopeless, and there is no chance of us being reconciled with God ever, apart from Christ. And in the midst of this picture, with God on the one side, a massive chasm, and us on the other side, where our sin created this deep uh, chasm between us sinful, dirty people and God perfectly holy and pure. Jesus steps in and says, I am the way. I am the way back. But notice Jesus doesn't say, I'm a way back. One path up the mountain. He says, I am the way back. He is the only bridge that can cross the chasm. There is only one way back to God. So how do we get access? How do we get to, so to speak, walk across the bridge? Walk the path that Jesus uh, uh, lays out for us? It is by recognizing that we are completely hopeless, completely lost. It is coming with nothing to our name, no works, no good deeds, no self-made uh, path up the mountain, but coming with nothing to God, to Christ, and saying, Yes, Lord, I will accept the free gift of grace that you offer. It is entrusting in the sacrifice of what Jesus does on the cross, where, uh, where he dies for our sin, and believing that that death is for my sin too. And it is acknowledging that we have sinned and fallen so far short that we simply cannot cross that chasm without Christ. And so coming to the Lord and saying, please forgive me and cleanse me from my sin. Help me to trust in what you have done. Because friends, when we do that, when we repent of our sin and when we trust in Christ, he, uh, he takes our sin too on his shoulders, goes to the cross, suffers and dies in our place and so builds a bridge for us too 
to get across the chasm. You see, he gives us the way back to God. But he gives us the only way back to God. Friend, if you want to cross the chasm between where you're at and where God is, you need to repent of your sin, accept the free gift of grace that Jesus offers, because it is the only way across. Our world hates that message. It has hated that message for centuries. And to be honest, if we're honest with ourselves, in our heart of hearts, we too hate that very same message. We want to be able to save ourselves. We want to be able to walk up the mountain. But there is no mountain. There is just a chasm. And Jesus is the only way across. Jesus is the only way. That's why we need him to be the way. But we also need him to be the truth. We need him to be the truth. You see, most of us who kind of are familiar with the teachings of the Bible can understand why it is that we need a way across the chasm. But why do we need Jesus to be the truth? We can understand that our sin makes us unclean before God and that we need Christ to rescue us. But what's all this business about the truth? Why do we need Jesus to be the truth? Well, we need to think about what Jesus means when he says, I am the truth. In what way can someone be the truth? You know, the truth is a real and accurate representation of the facts. It is something that accurately describes or depicts something. A lie, by contrast, is a statement or a description of something that is um, completely false. Now, I believe that... Um, uh, that this is the way we're supposed to understand what Jesus is saying. He's, he's saying, I am a true representation of God. He is the revelation of God. Jesus shows us God as he truly is. Now, John opens up his gospel by proclaiming that Jesus is the divine word who became flesh and dwelt among us. In a sense, he is God's message to the world saying, here, look, look, this is what, what God looks like. This is who God is. This is what his kingdom is like. This is what love looks like. This is what a true life lived for God looks like. In a sense, Jesus is the message and the messenger. He is the divine revelation of God and he is the revealer of God. In Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verse 2, uh, the author of Hebrews uh, says this. He says, In the past God has spoken to our fathers through the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. So Jesus is the revelation from God. He accurately speaks God's word and truth to us. And he shows us who God really is. In a sense, Jesus comes to correct a lie that's been hanging around for a thousand years. Now, why do, we, why do we need this truth? Because exactly that. Our world has been living this lie for thousands of years. Our world has been filled with lies and half-truths. And so we actually need a true revelation from God because we are prone to believing any kind of lie that, that the world offers us as some sort of spiritual life. You know, we uh, recently had the spring equinox. Now, the equinox is the day when uh, the, the amount of time in the day and the night is exactly the same. So you've got 12 hours during the day and 12 hours of night. Now, I was listening to a podcast around, um, <coughs> around that time that showed us how on this one day, the British government allows people to go to Stonehenge and, and kind of celebrate their druid rituals and, and things on that day. And the person who, uh, who was being interviewed was a woman who was explaining how um, the vibrations of the universe were magnified by the stones of Stonehenge. And that these vibrations could do everything from heal cancer to making you smarter and more intelligent. And next to her was a guy who was uh, playing a didgeridoo. And he was trying to find um, the kind of exact frequency at which the stones resonate so that he could harmonize with them and kind of amplify this, uh, this effect. Now, 
as I was listening to this, I was thinking to myself, how can people actually genuinely believe this? Why do we grasp at such ridiculous spiritual straws? Because, friends, we've been believing Satan's lie ever since the world fall into, fell into sin. Humanity has been grasping for anything that gives us some sort of semblance of spiritual life ever since the fall of sin. That's why we need Jesus. We need him to come and show us. We need him to show and reveal God's truth to us. You see, without that true revelation from God, humanity will go on believing and trusting in fake idols and fake gods and all kinds of fake hopes at some sort of eternity. The world has been operating under a spiritual lie for thousands of years. Ever since Satan first whispered the words, did God really say? Did God really say? This lie has been echoing down through the centuries. It made Adam and Eve question whether God's restriction to not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden was even good for them to begin with. And Satan's lie makes them think that God's law, God's will, is ultimately too restrictive for them. And we believe the same thing. We believe that God's laws and commandments are there to stop us from realizing our full potential. And this lie underscores how we see the world even today. This lie is the theme tune that plays in our minds every time we want to sin and the Holy Spirit reminds us that this sin will hurt you. This is the lie we listen to every time we sin anyway because we think it will make us feel good. This is the lie we listen to when, when we sin because we believe that God's way is too restrictive for us. We hear this lie every time we come up against a commandment, every time a rule is put into place, every time a restriction is placed upon us that we don't want to obey. We hear this lie that Satan has been telling from the beginning. Because we believe deep down that it is just stopping us from becoming who we were truly meant to be. We believe the lie, friends, don't we, that... God's laws are there to stop us from really being ourselves. We believe the lie that God's laws are there to keep us from doing what we really want. Keep us from doing what we think we need to do. Satan's lie, says one uh, commentator, Satan's lie suggested that God's commands are not for our good. And that the way for mankind to experience freedom and blessing is to break God's commands. And that lie has marked the way of sin ever since. Brothers and sisters, don't you see that we are fed this lie every day, almost every hour? Don't you see that this is the catch cry of our entire world today? Be who you want to be. That's what the world tells us to do. And if something gets in your way, get rid of it. Don't let anyone tell you what you can and can't do. You can be whoever you want to be. Do whatever you want to do. As long as you don't hurt anyone, the world is your oyster and you deserve to have it your way. That's the motto of our world. Day in and day out, this is the lie that we are fed. From a young age, Disney teaches us, teaches our children this. No right, no wrong, no rules for me, I'm free. That's a line from the th uh, theme song of Frozen. No right, no wrong, no rules for me, I'm free. Every advertising campaign is aimed at that very same lie. If you have this thing, you will finally be happy. You will have the kind of life you deserve. The life you should lead however you want. Except this thing that was supposed to bring you happiness is never God's rules, is it? It's never God himself. It's never a life lived in dedication to your saviour. It's always some product or service. When you open a bottle of coke, you are opening happiness, we are told. 
There's a new website uh, and app called Curio, which uh, is designed to help you learn new things. But its advertising says, if you have this app, you will be more loved because you'll be the most interesting person in the room. Even the army, the very organization that has been defined by doing your duty to protect your country, has changed the way it advertises these days. Its current recruitment tagline is, do it for yourself. You see, we have fed this lie over and over. Have it your way. You will be fulfilled, loved, be interesting, be happy if you do things your way. But God, God's way is never that way. And that's why we need the truth. That's why we need Jesus to come and show us the truth. Because he ultimately lived the perfect life. He perfectly obeyed God's rules. He ultimately lived a life that in fact ended in humiliation and death. But we need to see, friends, that life is about more than things. It's about more than just trying to be interesting or indulging our every whim. There is a truth we need that our lives have value, not because we have the most likes or the most followers or the biggest salaries or the flashiest cars or the most number of Coke bottles uncorked and therefore having the most happiness. We, we need to hear the truth that we have value because we are in Christ. We, it is in being in Christ, our Lord crucified, our Lord glorified, that we find meaning. It is in serving Him and bringing Him glory that we finally have purpose and meaning and happiness. Jesus is the only truth that will bring us true joy. But where are you getting your truth from? Who are you listening to? Because Jesus is the truth. Okay, so we've seen how Jesus needs to be the way to get us back to God. We've seen how Jesus is the truth that reveals what life is all about and how the world works and in fact who God is. And let's focus just briefly then on why does Jesus need to be the life? Why do we need Jesus to be the life? Well, the short answer is because we're by nature dead. By nature, we are spiritually dead. Now, this is important because we are created to be beings of life, right? We, we have this eternity within us. But because of our sin, the Bible tells us that, that when you sin, you earn death. The wages of sin are, is death. And so... What does this do to humanity? This eternal sort of half lo- half aliveness, what does that do to us? Humanity has been pursuing life, eternal life, in all kinds of wrong ways. We need Jesus to be the life because he's the only one who can give us true life. You know, my favorite song is called um, Roll Away Your Stone. It is by Mumford and Sons. And the reason I love it so much is it be, is because it explains exactly this truth. And the second verse goes like this. It says, You told me that I would find a hole within this fragile substance of my soul. And, all the, uh, and I have filled this void with things unreal, while all the while my character it steals. I filled this void, this gap in, in his soul with unreal things with things unreal and all that it does is continues to steal his character that's it friends that's why we need jesus to be the life we crave the kind of eternal life that only jesus can give we want something to give us back that sense of eternal life but we look for it in all the wrong places jesus's work on earth would be incomplete if he didn't give us life you know we saw how he had to be the way he had to be the one to build that bridge that that over that chasm to get us back to god and we saw that how he had to be the truth to point us to god and say look here is what true truth looks like but unless he also gives us life we wouldn't even want to cross that bridge to begin with 
We would not want to go back to God, back to our spiritual homes. And we continue to look for life in dead things, in idols. We continue to look for life in our relationships with our friends. We look for life in family and stability, in prosperity and wealth. We look for health, uh, sorry, we look for life in health and well-being and, and how other people treat us. Even perhaps in our community, even perhaps in our church community. But all of these things are essentially uh, unreal things that we want to try and use to fill that void within our souls. Things unreal that steal our character. You see, ultimately your friends will leave you and disappoint you. And even if they are the very best friends in life, in the end they will eventually die and leave you behind. Your family will ultimately hurt you because they are broken people too. Your wealth and prosperity is fickle. Your wealth can be gone in an instant. The world could go through a pandemic and wipe out your, uh, your wealth overnight. Your money cannot give you that sense of life you crave deep within your soul. Your health, no matter how fit, how well you eat, will ultimately fail. And you will die. People will ultimately disappoint you. And even your church family, your brothers and sisters in Christ, will do things that you don't agree with or act in ways you think they shouldn't. And if you have filled your heart, try to shove those things into the hole that only Christ can fill, then your life will fall apart when these unreal things disappoint you. Only Jesus can fill that gap in your soul. Only Christ can give you life. Only Jesus. We started this morning by saying that the gospel is offensive. It is offensive because it is so exclusive. And we've seen that it is exclusive because Jesus himself says that he is the only way back to God the Father. It is exclusive because Jesus himself says he is the only person who can truly reveal God to you. And it is exclusive because Jesus says he is the only one who can give you eternal life and fill that void within your soul. It is exclusive, but the question is, do you trust Jesus? Do you take him at his word? Because if you do, you can have life and have it abundantly, as he says it comes to bring it in John chapter 10. So who are you listening to? Jesus or the world? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, what a wonderful and challenging gift it is to know that you are the way, the truth and the life. And yet, Lord, we uh, want to acknowledge that in our society today, this is a, a difficult message, uh, an offensive message, an exclusive message. We pray that you will plant it deep in our hearts and help us to trust you as the one, the only one who can uh, give us a way back to God the Father, the only one who can truly reveal him, and the only one uh, who can truly give us life. Amen.